welcome. To, to an explanation of the logic behind the use of high ratio reduction in an energy processing transform. So, a, oh, a water wheel is always as tall as the, as the available head, or the radius is equal to one-half the head. Just basic math. Um, and... These are, these are applications where, over, where, where water wheels are used, where the conditions are suited to the use of that type of turbine. The flow rate is thus and such, and the amount of head is, 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 is limited to what's practical to do with a water wheel. And if you, some of them had been made as tall as 14 meters uh, in the past, but that's, that's an aside. And the energy that's being captured is, is the vector of the direction of gravity, straight down. The, so the curving motion of the wheel is, is a loss in efficiency because it's not going straight down. And the water is only in the buckets for about 100 degrees of rotation. In the age of wind, uh, wind turbine, utility scale wind turbines, this is a mature, understood technology, and the rotors just keep getting bigger because that's where the power is. By today's standards, a 75 meter radius is small, <laughs> and but it's large enough to give an inherent mechanical advantage in these turning levers of 75 to 1. That's just a ton of mechanical advantage, and it's, it's inherent. It's not done through gearing or anything. Down here at the center, there's that much torque, just tons. However, the, the performance of the rotor and its swept area ends up being a, a, torus, a toroidal shaped thing that's not the full area, not the full swept area. Th this is just a guesstimate, but it, it, it illustrates my point that the most energy to be converted is out here. See, down here, it's not 75 to 1, it's, it's maybe 60 to 1. So staying out here would be a good thing if we were wanting to apply our own power to the thing. And um, so instead of the vector being interrupted like it is here, it's not, it's less interrupted. We've got a horizontal movement of air going through there, and things are... Things are happy. So, what if instead we were able to mount a, a ring, a rim, on a wind turbine rotor? Then we have a way to apply power at that maximum energy radius. And the implications are obvious here, especially if one acknowledges the significance of rotary motion and its associated force, torque being scalar. So, with that in mind, what I'm working on right now is this, a prime mover. Here's the numbers and information. 
uh, and it has an inherent mechanical advantage of about 2 to 1 because this radius is smaller than this radius. This radius is where the, the force is being produced in the motor. So if we can take out energy at a smaller radius, it's a good thing. It's inherent mechanical advantage within the machine. So the machine starts out with an advantage. The drive motor starts out with an advantage. And we use that value for further calculations. Um, and the, but these, these are the measurements of, of what's, what's going on in terms of cal estimating the inherent mechanical advantage. So then, this is the side view of the large driven wheel. For proof of concept, I'm just trying to use one prime mover to make slightly more energy more electrical energy out than was consumed in the process. Uh, there's, a real, there's a point where these technologies converge, the old and the newer. The rotary lever and, and the modern mo rotary machines that we have today and the efficiency that we've got, we're getting out of electric motors. And this is a classic example. I'm, you Ideally a high-speed prime mover is a good thing that actually allows the system to be made smaller, I would say, because my system has ended up with a 30, uh, 34.5 to 1 reduction at this mesh here. And it's a, but it's a friction drive, so there's plenty of losses. But if I can even break even, it would be a wonderful thing. I found online a physically smaller PMA for uh, lawn tractors. And um, it, however, um, it, is, it has an con outrunner configuration, though, like an outrunner brushless motor, uh, so that the load where the power is being generated is happening at this radius. So that, that, that effectively reduces the advantage that I've got here by that much. So it is reduced to 85.1% of the total, according to my math. So we end up with a final drive of 61.6 to 1 of the little motor turning the big wheel one time. And it's done that very in a very low loss, via a very low loss mechanism, not close ratio. Close ratio mechanisms are compact and they are high loss and you don't want to use a high loss thing here. So again, these are the numbers and I end up with an unloaded rotation rate um, at the PMA of, of 580 RPM. Now I don't know how this PMA performs yet, so you know, I can't provide, I can only provide so much information. This PMA has some cogging, which I'm not happy about, but when it's on the wheel, it's not quite so noticeable. So. Uh, so this this is the drive motor 75 watts AC consumption 20,000 RPM using a small enough drive wheel that Inherent MA is present in this system, the subsystem. Oh boy. Maybe, maybe, maybe it'll play nice. 
This is the large wheel mounted to the input pulley on, of the, uh, the small PMA. Um, the small PMA uh, radius, radius at which loads occurs, being smaller, again, this is allowing a more compact an exceptionally compact design that might be less efficient you know, at the end of the day. Uh, so, there you go. Uh, okay, so um, this pulley really is extended far from this and uh, the bell. So I made a full recess through this thickness of this and it's still hitting there, but I think it'll be okay for testing purposes, as some chaps used to be fond of saying. Okay, thanks.